Hi, I'm Victoria Ann Thorpe, and I'm here to introduce you to a very important walk that is across Washington State, starting in Spokane and ending up in Olympia, our state capital. The walk, we call it the Peace Journey, and it's about drawing attention to ending the death penalty in our state, which will lead to ending the death penalty everywhere, we hope. Um, and on this journey, we want to invite everyone along the way to join us. Please come out and walk with us a little bit the whole time. We'll be leaving uh, Spokane, headed for Ritzville, and then down to Wall Tri-Cities, Walla Walla. And then we're going to go across back up to Tri-Cities and over to Yakima, and then up to Ellensburg, and then come um, over to Seattle by way of North Bend, and we'll be going through like um, Issaquah, Seattle, uh, Federal Way, India, uh, Tacoma, and ending up in Olympia. So there'll be a lot of opportunity on the other side for a lot of folks to come out for the day, to walk with us, to talk with us, to just sit and visit um, or come join the whole walk. <laughs> that would be wonderful. We're going to have a great time. Uh, we're celebrating life instead of taking life is the point of the peace journey. This walk is in support of ending the death penalty, starting in Spokane. As you can see, beautiful Spokane behind me. And it's a civil rights issue that concerns all of us. It violates the rights of minorities. It's racially biased. The underprivileged, the deprived, the mentally ill, uh, low IQ, etc. You, This is the population that we find on our death rows, which we have over 3,000 of in the United States. There are eight in Washington. It's a human rights violation. Uh, we should all have the right to life. Who should, should our state have the right to kill? And how do we decide who deserves to die? These are really big issues that we would like to talk about in a very peaceful, um, compassionate way on this walk, drawing your attention. Uh, there's also the risk of killing innocents. We have 142 persons in the United States who have been totally exonerated from death rows since 1972. They were totally innocent, and many of them were nearly going to be executed before we finally were aware of their innocence. And there are many that have not been so lucky, and we do know we have executed innocents. We've made mistakes and it can happen again. We are human beings, we're imperfect, and mistakes happen. So this is a really, really big and important issue, as you can tell, to my heart. Um, and the reason it came to my attention is because um, I'm personally involved. I have a sister on death row in California, Carrie Lynn Dalton, and she's been on this road, this journey, for 18 and a half years. So some symbolism is in this journey. We will be walking for 18 and a half days because I carry my sister's story with me as an example of all, almost everything that can go wrong with the system. She was convicted of a crime, of a capital punishment crime and sentenced to death without a body, without blood evidence, without weapons, without a crime scene. And it is um, on the record, there was no one declared deceased during her trial until she was convicted, there was not even somebody to have been known to have been dead. And to this day, there is no physical evidence and no proof there was ever a murder. And she is still waiting 18 and a half years later on death row for her chance to have an appeal. She has never had that chance yet. She is still in the system. So, Carrie, I love you, and I'm going to take you with me. Again, I um, said we want to invite people along the way, all the Washingtonians to come out and join us. This is a very peaceful, it's gatherings, it's um, bringing community together, it's to focus on all of our society to make it more peaceful and compassionate and safe for everyone. Our state does have the death penalty, many people don't realize that. We execute by way of lethal injection or hanging, and we hanged two people in the 90s. Our last execution in Washington State was in 2010, in September. We mostly don't hear about it. In our modern facilities, there's really no excuse for us to have to kill someone that we have captured and we are holding them helpless. We are not legally allowed to kill anyone 
who is helpless yet we have given the state the power to do that to these persons that we have on death row i'd like you to have conversations with me about that and and see if we can come to a more peaceful way to resolve this we can keep society safe by um, keeping those persons that we have decided are unsafe they're too violent to be loose in society we can keep them in our modern facilities without the fear of their escape and that is what our own superintendents and for former superintendents in Washington State will provide you with that information. Um, the journey from Spokane will head out to Cheney and Ritzville and then down to Walla Walla and Walla Walla is our Washington State Penitentiary and that is where our death row is and we have eight men as I said um, surviving death row here and in Walla Walla we are going to have gatherings again peaceful discussions and we are going to gather at the prison in support of the staff and the residents of the facility just holding people up in our hearts and in our thoughts and and not forgetting these are people the people who work there the people who live there the inmates as they're referred to and to bring about our thoughts to those who have no voice to give them voice the only reason to continue the death penalty is for revenge. It's way too expensive. We risk killing innocents. We know statistically it violates so many marginalized persons' rights and lives. It is not keeping us safe. So the only reason left is revenge. And that is something that we should really talk about. Is it worth the revenge? It, it doesn't bring closure to victims' families. It doesn't bring real healing and it wastes a lot of resources and money. It is far, far more expensive than to try someone for life without parole and contain them for life. It is far more expensive to do the death penalty system all the way through and execute someone. So we could save that money and we could use reallocate it for helping victims' families, for uh, prevention of violent crimes, for programs. We could do a lot more with that money. Anyway, along this trip, um, hope you'll check in again. What we'll do is update you, tell you where we are, and tell you more of the story as we go. And if you'd contact us and let us know what you want to know, um, we'll try to answer those questions. We're at Fellowship of Peace at G uh, wait, Fellowship of Peace Foundation at gmail.com. You can email us. We're on Facebook as The Peace Journey and Fellowship of Peace. And I hope to meet so many of you and to talk with you and answer your questions and you tell me your thoughts. If um, you'd like me or anybody in our group to talk with you as individuals, groups, churches, organizations, we'd be very happy to. That's really the point of what we're doing besides um, physically being able to uh, walk and carry the burden of the people that we are working for on death rows and you would be able to contact us at fellowship of peace foundation at gmail.com or through the Facebook there's a fellowship of peace Facebook and there's one called the peace journey also send us an email and we'll get back to you uh, we have people back home in Spokane who will be relaying messages while we're out on the road so uh, also if you want to catch up to us we'll tell you exactly where we are if you um, get a hold of us and we hope you meet us. The Peace Journey will begin this September 3rd, 2013, walking out of Spokane and we will finish in um, Olympia, the state capital, on September 21st. And that is also the International Day of Peace, so very appropriate. And it is also the anniversary of a very well publicized execution here in the United States, Troy Davis was executed two years ago this International Day of Peace and he was one example of someone who was should have gotten an appeal uh, there was very 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 grave doubts about his case um, internationally uh, people participated in protesting and crying for opening the case again reviewing it giving him a trial and instead he was executed so um, please come out and find out more details or go to our websites, um, but mostly we want to get together and talk and start a conversation and make a big change 
that is towards peace and towards safety for all of us. I hope I see you. As you may know, our professor and friend John Grayson was recently detained by Egyptian authorities with his friend and colleague, Dr. Tarek Lubani. Even though no formal charges have been laid against them, they continue to be held for an indeterminate amount of time. We thought it would be a good idea to ask his former students, What has John taught you? How to have commitment to justice, equality, and change. How to be courageous and take risks. How to speak up against injustice. How to be full of love. To appreciate the white squirrels of the world. That responding to the present social and political moment is more important than waiting for the perfect moment. How to be playful with your work. How to be diplomatic. That there's always something you can do to help. Always use split screen. That the best way to say something may also be the funniest. <laughs> that a rose is a rose is a fig. That you can be a positive and happy person and create art on your own terms. How to invert things. How to start a day at four in the morning. How to be generous with your time. That with the right treatment, Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, and Elton John are always on your side. That radical content always necessitates radical form. In other words, always use split screen. How to be a nice guy. How to love opera. <laughs> and also hate opera. <laughs> How to love documentary. How to juggle dozens of projects at once. Yet still have time for karaoke. That when in doubt, ask a penguin. That you can be a great filmmaker, even in hiking boots. That it's okay to wear orange pants. Even when accepting big awards. That even in moments of harsh criticism, you can be both gracious and generous. When someone is wrongfully imprisoned, you do everything in your power to get them out. Children listen to what they need to know. Speak on the side of love. Hi, I'm Pam Larratt, a lover of justice, of freedom, and of truth. I often find myself saying things that are only partially true about American democracy. I mean, we have a great society and a great country, and yet so many things are and have been fundamentally wrong. The criminal justice system is one that we're focusing on today, and it is broken. Uh, it, many people have commented on how bad and how wrecked the system of criminal justice is. I've never been able to stay quiet, however, on matters of injustice. So when I met Victoria Thorpe, who asked me to write a song about her sister who was wrongly convicted and sent to death row, I was thrilled. And that's pretty much why I wanted to get the word out about what happened to this sister, Carrie Lynn Dalton, and why she should be free. And Victoria, who has just returned from her journey for freedom, will tell you all about it right after the song. A song for Carrie and Dalton who would not play the game or lie on the stand. The law brought her all the way down to death row to cover the blood on their San Diego County The year was 
seven years to build an empty trial no body no blood stains no crime scene no guns Carrie Lynn never harmed a soul on the highway justice waits for the guilty one the courts are filled with bribes and corruption from the judge to the prosecutor down to the police so many wrongful executions on death row and many more Seventeen years locked up in California in a cage that measured six feet by ten. By day she sleeps to hide from all the pain. At night she lives for freedom again. No matter how far she goes. No matter how long she's gone You never forget your sister's smile You'll be at your window pane When she runs up your road again Sister, it's been a long, long while Oh, sister you said just a little while Oh, but it's been a long, long while Excuse me, um, Pam's song <laughs> really um, affected me, so let me pull myself together a moment. I've heard it before, but... Um, it's something to hear her singing it. Um, let me start with this. That will help me get back on balance here. <laughs> May 23rd of 1995, I sat in the frigid courtroom listening to a scripted dissertation slide easily from the Honorable Judge Thomas J. Whalen's lips. I hope your witnesses were sincere and that you have found God I hope that he forgives you. The meticulously groomed, silver-haired man in a perfectly creased, shimmering black robe peered over the top of his glasses and turned his head just an inch to his left as he spoke directly at the defendant. His melodramatic words followed the pronouncement that he was upholding the sentence to kill my sister. The reality of what that entailed was only just settling in. I'd watched a complete farce from beginning to end come to its conclusion, and I realized I would never be safe. My family was not safe. The system did not work. There were no checks and balances in place to ensure justice was served for all. This could happen to anyone, anyone without enough money to fight back. How do innocent people end up on death row? The subject is normally so far removed from the average person's life concerns and interests, its insignificance affords it little attention. Through my personal experience of living with the capital case brought against my sister, Carrie Lynn Dalton, it will be revealed that our justice system does not always work. As a matter of fact, it is riddled with mistakes and personal agendas. That is how a case like this can lead to death row, a case with no body, no weapon, no blood, no crime scene. As a matter of fact, the alleged murder victim had not even been declared deceased during the trial, as the judge pointed out to his jury. 
Ladies and gentlemen, he said in the last question, Mr. Dusick, who is the prosecutor, asked, he mentioned that Melanie May, in this case, is deceased. That's a fact for you to decide. It's inappropriate for him to put that in question, whether or not Miss May is in fact deceased or not, because that's something for you to decide. And that's a quote from the judge during the trial while my sister was being prosecuted for the death penalty directly from the judge. <clears throat> so um, I am Victoria Thorpe, sister of Carrie Lynn Dalton. And I'm still trying to gather myself, sorry. <laughs> she was uh, sentenced to be executed in May of 1995. We were assured the appeals would go quickly within three years it would be overturned and she would be free. It was a fluke. It shouldn't have happened. Since she was arrested in May of 1992, I have been involved in her case, the hearings, the investigations, and the trial. And as of yet, 17 years, 17 and a half years later after she was convicted, she is still on death row and still waiting for appeals. We grew up together. We played together, we shared hopes and fears with each other, um, we fought sometimes, we argued, uh, we were sisters, but we're very, very close, very bonded, and we still are, and she's the closest, most closest kindred spirit that I have, most gentle, wonderful person I love very much. I knew nothing of the system back then, and many of you probably don't know a lot about it, and especially at this level. Not many of us have to have a reason to look into it. There are about 3,200 people living on death row, so the family members, friends and family of those makes us, um, persons like me, about one in every 100,000 citizens have to experience this system. Many of them fall away, run away. Um, it does, they don't only stigmatize the defendant, but the family, is part of the shame and the fear and the judgment, the harshness from not just the court system, but the citizens around. This journey for freedom came about rather quickly. The journey started with a visit to my sister in death row in California. Um, two armed guards bring her out in shackles, uh, sh chained to her waist, her legs chained together. They release her and, and lock us both in a room together so that no one else will be harmed. Um, we always start with a huge hug. That's all they let us have and an end with a hug. We laugh a lot. We cry. We have wonderful memories and we talk about the future. And she is so thrilled that I believe in her and haven't left her. I did for a period of time just trying to survive, but um, she is so thrilled that everyone out here, so many people, are listening and trying, and so are the other ladies on the row with her. I am wearing pretty much what I did for 17 and a half days. I wore shorts a lot because in California it's very hot. I even had one person say, do we still have the death penalty? California has 700 men on death row and 220 women. This journey was to bring attention, to humanize this situation, like um, I felt Dr. Um, Dr. Seuss's story, Horton Here's a Who, came to me in a different light than it used to as a child. If you will hear the calls of all those who've been convicted of capital crimes as you listen to this story this time, maybe it'll sound a little different. Since my sister's case and being on her side and loving her and knowing exactly what went wrong, I have learned through my investigations that there are many, many folks in the system that have been taken advantage of and are losing their lives in one way or another. And so now I am a voice like Horton, um, <laughs> running around trying to say, these are real people. Um, they have real hearts and souls, and we can't just be hurting them and throwing them away. There's got to be another way. So that's how Horton got into this. From that speck on that clover, their voices were heard. They rang out clear and clean, and the elephant smiled. Do you see what I mean? They proved they are persons, no matter how small, and their whole world was saved by the smallest of all. Um, 
And I feel that that little dust speck, these people, they don't have voices from most of the country to hear, especially those on death row. They're just really, really tucked away and locked away. So I wanted to share, as I did in my book, my sister. That's why she's, she's here. Bring the human side, as Horton was trying to share with the kangaroos and the monkeys who were just frightened and angry and thinking there's one way to deal with this, get rid of it. And so I did this on foot, um, representing my sister's journey, trying to survive on death row, where you are treated as though you are not alive, where she is actually locked up in a cage. And my book is called Cages, um, but not just for her, for my own personal cages. And for those, as I share the story of her trial and her life and what happened, their personal issues, whether it's ambition or drug addiction or a cruel childhood, there's many things that hold us back. And when we are called to a direction we're not comfortable with, as I am here, uh, you must step out. Horton stepped out. <laughs> I feel a lot like Horton many times. And that just uh, came to me a few months ago. I don't know why he um, came to mind. But if you try, you can make a difference. And that's one of the reasons I walked and why I'm here today, is to ask for each voice, each person, as the little who in Whoville made a difference every little bit that you participate in caring about your brethren, your fellow human being, will make a difference. And I would love to get some more help in this particular area. Um, my sister is wrongfully convicted, but I have met many people in the system who have done the crimes that they are convicted of, and they are still people, they are still human beings worthy of love. And another thing that Mark Furman actually says in his book, in his words, he says, even a scumbag, was his word, uh, deserves to be treated fairly and justly, not framed and not tortured. And he's a person, too, and a person who actually was brave enough to look into the death penalty in depth and change his mind publicly and passionately for what he believes. In my sister's case, no evidence whatsoever, um, drug addicts involved, hearsay testimony, and then finally a co-defendant um, succumbed to pressure and testified against her to get a plea deal. And this often happens in cases, plea deals. Uh, it was six and a half years later after an, the alleged murder. They waited, um, my sister waited nearly three years in jail before they tried her. It took two years to get this co-defendant to turn on her. There's a lot of issues that are behind these things. Uh, why do this case? There was um, a reason for the police, the law enforcement in San Diego, to deter attention from their own issues. There was a serial murder going on that they were implicated in. And one of the first quotes from a uh, prosecutor was, he's hoping that this will lead them to another direction and away from the police. That was never solved. There was insufficient evidence dropped um, against the police. One police officer was fired. A couple others were demoted or shifted around, and then it all went away. So that's a very complicated case with a lot of corruption. And in the book, it, um, I use the trial transcripts, so I don't tell you my opinion or what I saw. I quote exactly from the trial what happened, so you can see for yourself um, how a trial goes. And also, I include my sister's life and my life our childhood, our growing up together, our differences, our different directions. Um, she went off one way, became addicted. I went off another way and became well, addicted to substances. I became addicted to my faith and closed-minded. So we led different lives, but kind of the same. So what we're trying to do is get the death penalty system changed because it's too big for us to conquer. Um, again, like Horton, all those um, Wickersham brothers ganging up, even though he's so big and it, like he has the truth, can't do it alone. We need to change the system and we need more voices to do that. So everyone here can be part of that. And in Washington State, we are trying to replace the death penalty with life without parole so that we will stop the killing. My sister's case, um, she happens to be innocent. 
I was in on the hearings, the trial, the investigations. I've been investigating for years. Uh, but because of her, I've learned, as Mark Furman did, that we have no right to judge and kill others and torture them along the way and take their lives. I use my sister's case as a great example to try to attract attention to all the things that can go wrong. Almost everything went wrong in her case. Um, in May of 1992 is when she was arrested with two other co-defendants. And so since then, we have been going through this, living this. So that's about 20 years. And 17 and a half of those years were on death row. We, um, part of the journey was to symbolically walk, carry my sister's burden with me, but also to share it with as many people as I could, whether it was people I met as I'm walking or to um, let people know ahead of time where I was and talk to groups of people. Started out 92 degrees in Fresno. Uh, it was a great start too though because the Center for Nonviolence welcomed me and um, the news crew, local channel 47, came out to talk with me about it and with them and it was a great send off. And the ladies uh, where Carrie lives in the cage on death row in California, there's 20 of them and one of them had a little TV that they saw the news and they were all very excited. She called me um, when she could a couple days later and everyone was so thrilled that somebody out there knew they were there. It was very touching. You never know where you're going to find an answer or a lead to help free your loved one. And then I have also gathered other loved ones along the way who live on death row as much as I try to not right now because it is a big job just to concentrate on one case. And I do hope to continue working once my sister is free and her case is um, reversed, she's exonerated. I think the answer is that we need to care about each other, which obviously I'm, I'm sure all you folks think of that and feel that and remember it. But those that are incarcerated are separated and forgotten and thrown away and judged. Um, Myrta also mentioned demonizing, vict um, stigmatizing, calling them monsters, evil. A person's a person. And very often they are hurt or injured, those who hurt others and lash out. And we do and should keep ourselves safe, but we should not commit the same kind of atrocities that we say are wrong to those who have been found guilty of creating violence. Violence begets violence. We have many, um, many voices that are trying to be heard, but like in the story, your voice is important. This is what I'm hoping today, that everyone will learn a little something and be moved to continue to learn and to be a little bit active at least, if not very active, in our society and in changing it to peace and love and promotion. Uh, use our resources for good and not evil. <laughs> um, our resources are being used up to prosecute and to cage people and then to finally kill them, but their lives are being stolen along the way. Justice Blackman um, said in 1994 that we've tinkered long enough with the system, and yet we're still doing it. Justice Stevens has changed his mind and outwardly speaks against the death penalty. Uh, Judge Trott, law professors, uh, various retired law enforcement, um, not just Mark Furman, but Scott Turow is a writer who's an ex-prosecutor, and um, he helped Illinois change their system so that the death penalty is no longer enacted because he was part of the commission that reviewed how the system works and really how it doesn't. And each one of these people also got to know someone personally. So the facts and the emotions come together. And also there's Judge Fletcher in California. Well, he's, not a, he's on the Ninth Circuit. He wrote a 101-page dissent to say he's against what the circuit decided on a Kevin Cooper case. It's not just my sister's case. They, um, he said they know that the um, sheriffs have planted evidence in his case 
and the prosecutor, the DNA, and they also destroyed evidence, and yet he is not getting an appeal. This is just another example of they're not being heard. There's something wrong along the way. Uh, and I had a, another quote from Mark Furman. One of the things he learns was that in the death penalty, more things go wrong than at any other level of the system because of the motivation and the pressure for careers and the money that's involved, et cetera. Um, there's more misconduct and there's more, the mistakes are a higher risk when you're taking somebody's life or you're locking them away for 10, 20 years and then finding out you made the mistake. You can't give that back to them. Mr. Furman said, every murder is heinous, atrocious, and cruel. By executing the innocent, we have committed an act that is just as heinous, atrocious, and cruel ourselves. And we have, we know we have killed innocent people in the United States. In my career as a detective, both as a police officer and as an author, I've always followed the evidence wherever it led. My investigation of the death penalty in Oklahoma County has brought me to this conclusion. Death penalty cases are not investigated or prosecuted at a level that can guarantee justice or even that the accused is actually guilty. I no longer believe in the death penalty. I no longer have faith that is, it is administered faith fairly or justly. I fear that innocent people have been executed. And that's why I am calling for the abolition of the death penalty, not only in Oklahoma, but in every state. So um, I wanted you to know that it's not without hope. <laughs> there are ways to change this. First, we need to acknowledge it, accept it, um, and go forward to make some corrections. One big correction in the system would be that prosecutors would be held accountable. Right now they have full immunity. So even if they choose to purposefully have someone perjure themselves, remove evidence, etc., if it's purposeful, it's, if it's illegal, they are immune. So just simply changing that and saying accountability, just like you, me, um, doctors, everybody, um, if you do something illegal, it should be looked at, but there is no level of being able to uh, address that for prosecutorial misconduct. So that's something we can change. That's hands on. It will stop many of the problems with wrongful convictions in the future. We can lessen that. And then there's the snitching issue, and that's um, a big thing in my sister's case also, besides the prosecution. Um, we have very many Brady violations. That means there was uh, it, information kept away from the defense that would show that, that my sister was not a murderer, that there wasn't even a murder, actually. But once you're in the system, it's really, really hard to reverse it. And as a society, we need to help and care for each other more and separate those who don't play nice, is an easy way to say it, but do it gently and caring and it also will cost us less money, less taxes, to do this the right way, the caring way. And it will pay for all of society to help each other become loving people. And if those can come back in society, some cannot. So I would ask that we would all please look into this. And um, in Washington State, we have safe and just alternatives. Keep everyone safe. Keep us safe from violent criminals. Keep the violent criminals safe. Understand them with life, without the possibility of parole. And it will also save you money. It costs a lot more for us to have death penalty cases and death penalty appeals and then find out we did something wrong also and it was a waste of time. We need to take away that career building carrot. It's used as, look how tough on crime I am and I've kept you safe. I've got a, a murderer. We're going to kill him and you'll never be threatened again. It's just not the truth and the facts. So please, um, I'd like to ask you all to reach into your hearts and think about if your sister, if your loved one was in this situation, what would you do? Everybody out there is somebody's son or daughter or sister or loved one in some way. Please understand and open your hearts and choose 
forgiveness and compassion instead of revenge and anger and fear. I went up on the mountainside to see what I could see and the vision that was given there I carry on with me. And I could see for miles and miles, and also unto time. And the love and the magic of this earth was yours as well as mine. And all the creatures, large and small, were given all their due. And the fear that once had barred our hearts was replaced with only truth. This is what hope looks like. This is what love looks like. And it will only grow. The choice you are making today is, what side are you on? I appreciate this opportunity to speak openly to you for the first time. I am here asking that you know me. At the auction, the first person who asked me what I was doing there was Agent Don Love. And I told him very clearly that I was there to stand in the way of an illegitimate auction that threatened my future. I proceeded to answer all his questions openly and honestly and have done so to this day. I've made my views clear that I agree with the Founding Fathers that juries should be the conscience of the community and a defense against legislative tyranny. I never attempted to taint the jury, as claimed, by sharing any of the relevant facts about the auction in question that the court had decided were off limits. I didn't burst out and tell the jury that I successfully raised the down payment and offered it to the BLM. I didn't let the jury know that the auction was later reversed because it was illegitimate in the first place. To this day, I still think I should have had the right to do so, but disagreement with the law should not be confused with disrespect for the law. I have also made public statements about the value of civil disobedience in bringing the rule of law closer to our shared sense of justice. In fact, I have openly and explicitly called for nonviolent civil disobedience against mountaintop removal coal mining in my state of West Virginia. Mountaintop removal is itself an illegal activity, which has always been in violation of the Clean Water Act, and it is an illegal activity that kills people. A West Virginia state investigation found that Massey Energy had been cited with 62,923 violations of the law in the 10 years preceding the disaster that killed 29 people last year. The investigation also revealed that Massey paid for almost none of those violations because the company provided millions of dollars worth of campaign contributions that elected most of the appeals court judges in the state. When I was growing up in West Virginia, my mother was one of many who pursued every legal avenue for making the coal industry follow the law. She commented at hearings, wrote petitions, and filed lawsuits, and many have continued to do so ever since, to no avail. I actually have great respect for the rule of law because I see what happens when it doesn't exist, as in the case of the fossil fuel industry. Those crimes committed by Massey Energy led not only to the deaths of their own workers, but to deaths of countless local residents, such as Joshua McCormick, who died of kidney cancer at age 22 because he was unlucky enough to live downstream from a coal mine. When a corrupted government is no longer willing to uphold the rule of law, I advocate that citizens step up to that responsibility. This is really the heart of what this case is about. The rule of law is dependent upon a government that is willing to abide by the law.
Disrespect for the rule of law begins when the government believes itself and its corporate sponsors to be above the law, claims that the seriousness of my offense was that I obstructed lawful government proceedings. But the auction in question was not a lawful proceeding. A federal judge ruled last year that BLM was in constant violation of this law throughout the Bush administration. In all the proceedings and debates about this auction, no apologist for the government or the BLM has ever tried to claim the BLM followed this law. In both the December 2008 auction and the creation of the resource management plan on which this auction was based, the BLM did not even attempt to follow this law. And this law is not a trivial regulation about crossing T's or dotting I's to make some government accountant's job easier. This law was put into effect to mitigate the impacts of catastrophic climate change and defend a livable future on this planet. This law was about protecting the survival of young generations. That's kind of a big deal. It's a very big deal to me. If the government is going to refuse to step up to the responsibility to defend a livable future, I believe that creates a moral imperative for me and other citizens. My future and the future of everyone I care about is being traded for short-term profits. I take that very personally. Until our leaders take seriously their responsibility to pass on a healthy and just world to the next generation, I will continue. The reality is not that I lack respect for the law. It's that I have greater respect for justice. Where there is a conflict between the law and the higher moral code that we all share, my loyalty is to the higher moral code. The authority of the government exists to the degree that the rule of law reflects the higher moral code throughout history. It has been civil disobedience that has bound them together. This philosophical difference is serious enough that Mr. Huber thinks I should be imprisoned to discourage the spread of this idea. The government's memorandum states, as opposed to preventing this particular defendant from committing further crimes, the sentence should be crafted to afford deterrence to criminal conduct by others. Their concern is not the danger I present, but the danger presented by my ideas and words that might lead others to action. The things I have been publicly saying may indeed be threatening to that power structure. There have been several references to the speech I gave after the conviction but I've only ever seen half of one sentence of that speech quoted. In the government's report, they actually had to add their own words to that one sentence to make it sound more threatening. The speech was about empowerment. It was about recognizing our interconnectedness rather than viewing ourselves as isolated individuals. The message of the speech was that when people stand together, they no longer have to be exploited by powerful corporations. Alienation is perhaps the most effective tool of control in America and every reminder of our real connectedness weakens that tool. But the sentencing guidelines don't mention the need to protect corporations or politicians from ideas that threaten their control. The guidelines say protect the public. The question is whether the public is helped or harmed by my actions. The easiest way to answer that question is with the direct impacts of my action. As the oil executive stated in his testimony, the parcels I didn't bid on averaged $12 per acre, but the ones I did bid on averaged $125. Those are the prices paid for public property to the public trust. The industry admits very openly that they were getting those parcels for an order of magnitude less than what they were worth. The oil company knew they were getting a steal from the American people. More generally, the question of whether civil disobedience is good for the public is a matter of perspective. Civil disobedience is inherently an attempt at change. Those in power, whom Mr. 
Huber represents are those for whom the status quo is working. So they always see civil disobedience as a bad thing. The decision you are making today, Your Honor, is what segment of the public you are meant to protect. The majority of the public is exploited by the status quo far more than they are benefited by it. The young are the most obvious group who is exploited and condemned. There is an overwhelming amount of scientific research that reveals that catastrophic consequences which the young will have to deal with over the coming years. But just as real is the exploitation of the communities where fossil fuels are extracted. As a native of West Virginia, I've seen from a young age that the exploitation of fossil fuels has always gone hand in hand with the exploitation of local people. In West Virginia, we've been extracting coal longer than anyone else. And after 150 years of making other people rich, West Virginia is almost dead last among the states in per capita income, education rates, and life expectancy. And it's not an anomaly. The areas with the richest fossil fuel resources, whether coal in West Virginia and Kentucky or oil in Louisiana and Mississippi, are the areas with the lowest standards of living. In part, this is a necessity of the industry. The only way to convince someone to blow up their backyard or poison their water is to make sure they are so desperate that they have no other option. But it is also the nature of the economic model. Since fossil fuels are a limited resource, whoever controls access to that resource in the beginning gets to set all the terms. They set the terms for their workers, for the local communities, and apparently even the regulatory agencies. A renewable energy economy is a threat to that model. Since no one can control the sun or the wind, the wealth is more likely to flow to whoever does the work of harnessing the energy and therefore to create a more distributed economic system which leads to a more distributed political system. It threatens the profits of the handful of corporations for whom the current system works. But our question is which segment of the public are you tasked with protecting? I am here today because I have chosen to protect the people locked out of the system over the profits of the corporations running the system. I say this not because I want your mercy, but because I want you to join me. The government tries to assume my intentions and then claims. This is consistent with the testimony that Mr. De Christopher provided at trial, admitting that his intention was to cause financial harm to others with whom he disagreed. The statement claimed by the government never happened. The statement in the government's objection is a complete fiction. The truth is that my intention then, as now, was to expose, embarrass, and hold accountable the oil industry and to play a role in the wide variety of actions that steer the country toward a clean energy economy. The only loss that I intended to cause was the loss of secrecy by which the government gave away public property for private profit. As I actually stated in the trial, my intent was to shine a light on a corrupt process and get the government to take a second look at how this auction was conducted. I knew that allowing the auction to proceed would mean the permanent loss of lands better suited for other purposes and the permanent loss of a safe climate. The intent was to prevent loss. I believe the important factor is the loss to the public, which I helped prevent. This is a case about the right of citizens to challenge the government. The U.S. Attorney's Office makes clear that their interest is not only to punish me for doing so, but to discourage others from challenging the government, even when the government is acting inappropriately. Their memorandum states, to be sure, a federal prison term here will deter others from entering a path of criminal behavior. The certainty of this statement not only ignores the history of political prisoners, it ignores the severity of the present situation. Those who are inspired to follow my actions are those who understand that we are on a path toward 
catastrophic consequences of climate change. They know their future, and the future of their loved ones is on the line. And they know we are running out of time to turn things around. The closer we get to that point where it's too late, the less people have to lose by fighting back. The power of the Justice Department is based on its ability to take things away from people. The more the people feel that they have nothing to lose, the more that power begins to shrivel. The people who are committed to a livable future will not be discouraged or intimidated by anything that happens here today. And neither will I. I will continue to confront the system that threatens our future. The people who are committed to a livable future will not be discouraged or intimidated by anything that happens here today. And neither will I. I will continue to confront the system that threatens our future. Democratic institutions give citizens access to power. My future will likely involve civil disobedience. Nothing that happens here today will change that. I don't mean that in any sort of disrespectful way at all, but you don't have that authority. You have authority over my life, but not my principles. Those are mine alone. I want you to join me in standing up for the right and responsibility of citizens to challenge their government. I want you to join me in valuing this country's rich history of nonviolent civil disobedience. This is not going away. At this point of unimaginable threats on the horizon, this is what hope looks like. In these times of a morally bankrupt government that has sold out its principles, this is what patriotism looks like. With countless lives on the line, this is what love looks like, and it will only grow. The choice you are making today is, what side are you on? Ah, the lands untouched and wild were held sacred and secure. And the wisdom that we gain from all was timeless and endured. Oh, I went up on the mountainside to see what I could see. And the vision that was given there, I carry on with me. And the vision that was given there, I carry on.